the next uh, uh, three um, uh, lectures that I have planned is uh, they're all about what I consider some of the major um, economic myths that are out there. So we're going to shift gears a bit. And uh, of course, there are so many of them that I could stand up here for the next five years talking about economic myths. But um, uh, the, myth of, the myth of antitrust is one of them. The myth of the New Deal is another one. And labor union myths is, is a third. And these myths all generally uh, have uh, uh, behind them what, what is going on is a condemnation of the free market and an explanation of why uh, um, historically government has come to the rescue of the free market and saved capitalism from itself. That's generally, that's generally the theme of all these myths. And so the myth of antitrust is why we need government to protect us from monopolists. Uh, the great the myth of the New Deal is the myth that capitalism caused the Great Depression and the New Deal uh, massive interventionism uh, cured it. And then uh, with regard to labor unions, there are all kinds of myths uh, that are used to prop up uh, the notion that th there should be special governmental privileges to promote unionism uh, over, over a, a free market and labor. And so, uh, like I said, there could be a many more myths that we could talk about. But those are three prominent ones that I've written about quite a bit. And so uh, I'm going to try to explain this, uh, understanding that not everyone has studied antitrust economics or microeconomics uh, necessarily that much. But I can explain it, I think, in fairly plain English. And um, the, the way I'm going to do it is start off with um, the original antitrust law or anti-monopoly law. It was called the Sherman Antitrust Act that uh, the US Congress passed in uh, 1890. And there's old Sherman again. I, I've quoted him this morning on banking policy. He was a champion of central banking. And uh, he's also, uh, uh, and he was in the uh, chairman of the uh, Senate um, Finance Committee in the 1860s. And he was still a prominent member of the Senate in 1890. So he had a very long tenure in, in Congress, did a lot of damage. And uh, in, a, in one of the talks I gave, uh, I concluded by saying that he, arbi he uh, arguably did more damage to America than did his, uh, his brother, William Tecumseh Sherman, Sherman's March and all that. And so uh, I gave that talk in Virginia, and it went over very well in Virginia. But it probably wouldn't go over well in Maine or someplace like that. But um, the general story about antitrust is that there was supposedly a rampant monopolization occurring in the 1880s, a rampant monopolization. And... Uh, if you look at almost any book, economics, an economics book, a law book that covers uh, antitrust, a uh, history book, a social studies book, it'll say this. It'll give some version of this story. And even some of the uh, better, more reputable economics textbooks. One example, and if you were to major in economics uh, 20 years ago, uh, and you took a course called Industrial Organization, chances are the textbook you would use would be one by a man named Friedrich Scherer. And he had the best-selling textbook in this area for, for several decades. I mean, he's still around. I think he still teaches at Harvard now. He's been in and out of Harvard for, for a while. And uh, this book said this. In the United States, the enforcement of the antitrust laws is the main weapon wielded by government in its effort to harmonize the profit-seeking behavior of private enterprise with the public interest. So uh, the idea is it's necessary to have these laws to, uh, to have competition, to harmonize things. And why is that? Well, historically, they say uh, there was monopolization. Let me see some classic quotes here. Richard Posner, who's now a judge, a federal judge, is uh, one of the prominent scholars in the whole law and economics movement. Uh, he used to teach at the University of Chicago, did that for many years. He wrote a book on antitrust law that is widely used at universities for a long time. And, uh, and he said this in his book on antitrust, the Sherman Act was passed in 1890 against a background of rampant cartelization and monopolization of the American economy. And so I picked him because he was a major critic of antitrust. His whole book is a book of criticisms on the misuse of antitrust. But even Posner, the, uh, one of the bigger critics of antitrust, says, well, there's a need for these laws because, after all, there was rampant cartelization. And how are we going to stop that? How are we going to stop uh, rampant cart uh, cartelization? 
Uh, another textbook author named Marshall Howard called the Sherman Antitrust Act the Magna Carta of free enterprise. And so that's the kind of language that you get. And so, uh, uh, no, I've been reading this stuff for a long time as, a, as an economic student. And then after I finished my PhD, I was doing research in this area. And it, and it struck me that um, I had never seen in any of these books uh, proof. You know, where's the evidence uh, you know, of rampant cartelization? I've seen all these statements. And so I just got the, uh, the idea of uh, doing a survey. And so I had a, a research assistant working for me. I was at George Mason at the time. Uh, and, uh, and I had a, a graduate student working for me. So I, so I said, let's gather up all the antitrust economics books we can find. I had about a dozen of them on my bookshelf. And he went to the library and, and went through dozens. And we did not find one single statistic that was used to back up this claim in any of them. Law books, economics books, there, there, there was no data. It was just bold statements, uh, rampant cartelization, monopolization, thank God for the Magna Carta of free enterprise, on and on and on. And, and uh, where's the evidence? None. There was none. So, and so uh, that got me to, uh, that made me a little curious. When, uh, whenever you have all these statements like this, but backed up by absolutely nothing, not even bad statistics. Sometimes they're bad or feeble statistics, or the, the, the uh, statistical analysis is, is incorrect. It, there was not, never even any an attempt uh, there. And so, so we gathered these statistics ourselves. Uh, what I did was I had this uh, student of mine uh, go and read through the congressional record of 1889 and 1890. And, uh, and back in those days, this was all on microfilm. So you had to go to the library and read, you know, there's microfilm machines. You had to crank them up and make the little film go around in a circle. And it's, you could hardly read it. And he's, he's, uh, I, I send him a check every year. He's in a home for the blind in uh, Arlington, Virginia, outside of DC because of this. But uh, so we read through all this. And I said, write down the industries that were being accused of being monopolies during the congressional debates over the Sherman Act. He wrote all these down. And then uh, the next step was, well, let's see if we can gather the data on what, what all these economics books say and monopolies do is they somehow conspire to restrain trade. That's what everybody says, that what these monopolies do and what they were doing. They were restricting production in order to prop up prices. Less supply will prop up the price. And so we, uh, we, we went and we found that in the historical, there's a publication called Historical Statistics of the United States. And I think they, the uh, Commerce Department just published a new version of it. It was, it was in print for about 30 or 35 years. And they just came out with a new version. And then there were other scattered statistics here and there that, that we dug up every source we could think of or, or find that would have uh, data on production of, uh, of all these things. Like some of the industries of salt, petroleum, zinc, steel, bituminous coal, steel rails, sugar, lead, liquor, twine, castor oil. These were, could you imagine uh, members of Congress in a debate on the floor of the House of Representatives with all the flags behind them and everything arguing over the, the price of castor oil? They, they apparently were, were doing that. Leather, these were all the things that they were arguing about at the time, the monopolies. And so, so we did it. We got, we got a lot, I think about 17 of these industries. There, there were just some data we just couldn't find for, for these, a lot of these industries that were mentioned in the congressional debates. But we got pretty good uh, data on, on a lot of them. And so what I found was that uh, during the decade prior to the Sherman Act, this was 1880 to 1890, uh, real gross national product, back in those days we called it gross national product, not gross domestic product, and it's adjusted for inflation, increased by about 24% during that decade. But these industries, my sample of industries that were being excoriated as monopolies, restricting output and driving up prices, on average, their production grew by 175% on average. Okay, seven times the rate of growth of the rest of the economy. So these, these industries that were supposedly restricting uh, production in a cartel fashion, uh, we're growing seven times faster than uh, than the, uh, the economy as a whole. So that that, that that continued to pique my interest in this whole thing. And then, uh, of course, what happened to prices? The ultimate test is what happens to consumers. Uh, the ultimate test, uh, uh, according to any uh, econ economics book that talks about uh, monopoly, 
is, uh, well, does it harm consumers? And one thing to look at is, well, what happens to prices? Okay, so we were using the standard neoclassical framework. We weren't even uh, getting into Austrian economics. We were just saying, on your own standards, well, you know, how does this meet the test of monopoly? And so uh, we did the same thing. We gathered what data we could on prices. And this was a period of deflation, uh, the, the decade between 1880 and 1890. And the, so the prices, uh, measured prices were falling uh, by, not by much, was 7% or something like that, I think. But uh, again, what I found was that uh, in, in every single case, except castor oil, I think, uh, oh no, except uh, coal. Now coal was the one exception. In, in every single item, the price was falling faster than the price level. And sometimes it was falling pretty rapidly. Uh, for, for example, the price of steel rails fell by 53% compared to a 7% reduction in the price level. Price of refined sugar, 22% decline. Uh, lead dropped by 12%. Zinc, 20%. Bituminous coal uh, remained about steady per pound, although it fell by uh, 29% um, from 1890 to 1900. So after the Sherman Act was passed, it really went through the floor. So all these prices fell much faster than uh, than did the, the general price level. So so these are some facts that if they don't prove that the Sherman Act was uh, misguided, at least it should lead anyone to call into question the standard story that there was rampant cartelization because all of these theorists that I mentioned at the beginning would all agree that rampant cartelization should have led to uh, output restrictions and higher prices. And uh, now what, what they could say to weasel their way out of it would be, well, yes, uh, the price fell by 52% and production increased by 300%, but were it not for the, uh, uh, if they weren't monopolized, it would have, uh, prices would have fell even faster. And that's, so that's, you know, that's one of those unprovable arguments that, that, that is, could usually ma be made. But it's not very convincing to me. And uh, another thing I found is that the members of Congress who were arguing over this and who were supporting the Sherman Act, they knew that the, the, uh, these trusts, as they were called, these corporations, they knew that they were causing lower prices. There was no discussion of uh, an alarm caused by higher prices. There's a Senator Edwards that I quote from the congressional record. He said this, although for the time being the sugar trust has reduced the price of sugar and the oil trust, he's talking about standard oil, certainly has reduced the price of oil immensely, that does not alter the wrong of the principle of any trust. So in principle, they're wrong. What principle could that be? It's, uh, it's the principle that they didn't want prices to go down. You know, that's, uh, that's the only principle I could determine is the, the principle that they're in favor. They're in favor of higher prices. That's their principle. And so they recognized that. They, they actually complained about lower prices. And why were they complaining about lower prices? Well, it's for the same reason, in my view, why politicians have always used the antitrust laws to prosecute various companies for dropping their prices. They have, they have uh, businesses in their districts or their states who are not as efficient as the price dropping companies. And they want to protect them from competition. So in other words, uh, what I'm talking about with, with my research here is that antitrust has always been a protectionist uh, plot. It has never been the Magna Carta of free enterprise. It has always been exactly the opposite. It has, al it has always been a government intervention that was always meant to stop competition, to, to be a barrier to competition. Uh, I mentioned Posner being a big critic. Well, he, he studied uh, various antitrust cases for a hundred year period and has come to the conclusion that uh, in, in most cases, these are decided wrongly. These are decided where there, these companies were not monopolizing and they were, and, but, but he seems to see it, see it as just a hundred year record of goof ups, mistakes. I don't see it that way. I see it as that, that was always the intent. It was always the intent to thwart competition. And so that these laws for 100 years did exactly what they were intended to do. They weren't, in, they weren't intended to protect consumers from competition. They were always intended to protect uh, politically connected competitors from competition. And that's, that's, uh, that's my story, and, I, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, 
And so um, further evidence of the political hanky-panky that was going on here that, uh, that I offer is that, you know, these prices fell for a decade before, uh, prior to uh, the Sherman Act, pretty precipitously. And they continued to fall for the next decade. So I gathered data for the next decade after the Sherman Act and the same trend. Because there were, there were you know, manufacturing was being developed. There were uh, economies of scale. Mass production was being fine-tuned and, 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 and uh, more and more used. Uh, there were technological advances such as uh, in the steel industry and the cement industry were causing lower and lower and lower costs of production. And as a result, you had lower and lower and lower prices for all of these things. That, it, was a, it was a great thing for the American consumer and for American industry that had to buy steel and cement to, to make things, to make housing, buildings, uh, and, and whatever, you know, bridges, whatever you're making out of steel. And so uh, this was a great thing. Uh, but most of the complaints came, as they always do, from uh, companies or, in some cases, farmers who were selling things and who were either unable or unwilling to drop their prices as fast as the so-called trust did. Therefore, the law was meant to stop that. And they all understood that. And this could not have been predatory pricing. You know, there's this old, uh, I call predatory pricing the uh, the unicorn of economic theory. You all know what a unicorn is. It's like the a goat with one big horn out of the front of its head. Um, I've never seen one, but I've seen pictures of them. And apparently no one else has ever seen a unicorn, but um, they've been talking about it for a long time. And um, predatory pricing is the idea that a, a company will uh, charge a very low price, even, even if it loses money, to put it in uh, layman's language, below its costs, with the intention of, losing, of driving everybody out of the market and then once they're all gone, it will charge a monopolistic price. And it's sort of an appealing theory, although it's not very logical when you think about it for a minute. Um, I, I put this to my one of my MBA classes. Um, I have students in these MBA classes who are like uh, uh, the vice president of marketing at McCormick Spice Company, which is in Baltimore, or the Black & Decker Tool Company. And I would ask these guys, well, what if you went back to work on Monday, these are Saturday classes, and told your boss, like the CEO of McCormick Spice Company or Black & Decker. Well, I learned something in, uh, in school on Saturday. Uh, I learned that how we can corner the, the drill market. You say you're at Black & Decker. Here's what we're going to do. It costs us $25, uh, the marginal cost of manufacturing this drill. We're going we're gonna to sell this drill for $5. And we're going to do this. It might take three, four, or five years. But we think we can drive all the competition out of the market if we can just hang in there for maybe five years. And, uh, and I asked them, well, what do you think your boss would say, say of that? And they all said, well, we'd be fired on the spot. They think we lost our minds. If you think about this for a minute, it's, 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 it doesn't make sense. And there's never been a proven example of a monopoly created this way, but it's, it's part of the, the folklore. And so uh, the, uh, when you come up with data like this, as I did with a 20-year price decline, uh, the critics will say, well, predatory pricing. But doesn't it sound kind of ridiculous to think that these businesses, like Standard Oil, John D. Rockefeller, who is one of the smartest businessmen in, men in world history, would purposely lose money for 20 years in hopes of someday making a killing? <laughs> why, would, why would he think that's how to make money? It's, it's absurd. So that, that didn't happen. That's not what was going on. This was competitive price cutting. And... Uh, Another part of the real, the real uh, political hanky-panky that I ran across was three months after the Sherman Act was passed, this was uh, July of, 19, of 1890, the Sherman Act was passed. October, early October, was the passage of the McKinley Tariff, which at the time was uh, one of the biggest tariff increases in history in the U.S. And the sponsor of the McKinley Tariff was Senator John Sherman himself. So here's the guy who supposedly is the savior of the consumer. His name is on the Sherman Antitrust Act. Three months later, he sponsors, as chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, the McKinley tariff increase, which at that time, everybody knew. You, can't, you couldn't argue that Adam Smith was hot off the press in 1890. You know, the Wealth of Nations was written in 1776. And, uh, and so everybody knew that tariff, high, you know, protectionist tariffs caused higher prices. Abe Lincoln didn't say, think that, but by then everybody knew this. It, was, it had been proven time and again. 
because they, we were in the era of uh, Republican protectionism for decades at this point. And so doesn't that smell rotten? The, supposedly the, uh, the champion of the consumer is raising everybody's prices by raising tariffs on imports. And, uh, and so that was another sort of smoking gun type of piece of evidence that I found. Sherman himself said this. He said he, he attacked these businesses that I just named, cited some of them by saying, they have subverted the tariff system. They have undermined the policy of government to protect American industries by levying duties on imported goods, end quote. That's Senator Sherman. He was saying, these guys are dropping prices. They're subverting our high price tariff system. And he's, so he's more or less calling them outlaws because the law created higher prices. The tariff law created higher prices. These guys come around and uh, they're not raising their prices like they're supposed to. They're cutting their prices because they're figuring out how to cut their costs and they're competing. They're not sitting back and saying, let's just, let's just let the government keep the competition away from us and get fat and happy. They weren't doing that. They were, these were some of the great entrepreneurs of American history that were, that were developing uh, uh, all these new industries and cutting costs and, and competing internationally. They weren't, they weren't, part, they weren't on board with this uh, protectionist scam. And so Sherman himself was complaining about that. And the next thing I had my uh, now barely able to read uh, former graduate student do is uh, I wanted to know, you know, I'd read in all these books stories about the muckrakers, the press, the muckraking media, what they were saying, what they were doing. Uh, so I thought, well, let's read firsthand what was being said in the major media. And so I had him read through the New York Times on microfilm in 1889, 1890, anything he could find. You could do this all online now, but these were the old days where we were barely out of the stone tablet age uh, when the, the, uh, the internet didn't exist back at this time when I was doing this research. And so um, Al Gore hadn't invented it yet. <laughs> and, uh, he was working on it. He was, uh, he, was, he was in graduate school working on it. But, uh, <clears throat> but um, so we read through, you know, let me know what the New York Times, the paper of record was saying about this, the whole the Sherman Act business. Let's not take these uh, left-wing muckrakers at their word why should we believe them, uh, you know, all these bo or quotes of them? And so anyway, the, it was kind of interesting. The New York Times was originally for the Sherman Antitrust Act, but then they just watched what was going on, and they totally rever reversed themselves and came out against it. And, uh, and here's uh, what they said. In, in October 1st, 1890, the New York Times, it's like the day the law was passed, they called it the Campaign Contributors Tariff Bill. Um, uh, well, the, well the, that is the McKinley Tariff. They called the McKinley Tariff the Campaign Contributors Tariff Bill. And, and, and they got the connection between what was going on here with the McKinley Tariff and the Sherman Act. It said the Campaign Contributors Tariff Bill now goes to the president for his signature, which will speedily be affixed to it. And the favored manufacturers, many of whom proposed and made the tariff rates, which affect their products, will begin to enjoy the profits of this legislation. So they're, they're complaining about that. There's something rotten here. And then they, they go on to say something about um, Sherman uh, in one of his speeches. They say, it should not be overlooked, his speech on Monday, for it was one of, the, one of confession. Okay. And they say, we direct attention to those passages of Sherman's speech relating to combinations of protected manufacturers designed to take full advantage of high tariff duties by exacting from consumers prices fixed by agreement after competition has been suppressed by the tariff. Uh, Mr. Sherman closed his speech with some words of warning and advice to the beneficiaries of the new tariff. He was earnest enough in his manner to indicate that he is not at all confident as to the outcome of the law. So he's, he's saying, I'm not too confident that this is going to work here, guys. The great thing that stood in the way of the success of the bill, the tariff bill, was whether or not the manufacturers of this country would permit free competition in the American market. Uh, and so uh, Sherman was trying to get off the hook for being the sponsor of the tariff bill. He, he knew prices were going to go up, but he wanted to blame it on the trusts. And so he couldn't blame it on his own legislation. He had to blame it on the trust if, the, if consumers complained. He wanted, the, they, the Republican Party wanted the, all the, the campaign bribes, the money, and the support from the manufacturers who this benefited, but they didn't want to take the heat from consumers who were going to pay more for all this stuff uh, in case they caught on. And so he was, he was getting off his hook. And so here's what the New York Times concluded, with, which I think is exactly what was going on here. I think 
they hit a home run with this, this paragraph here. They said, the so-called antitrust law was passed to deceive the people and to clear the way for the enactment of this law relating to the tariff. It was projected in order that the party organs might say to the opponents of tariff extortion and protected combinations, behold, we have attacked the trusts. The Republican Party is the enemy of all such rings. And now the author of it, Sherman, can only hope that the rings will somehow dissolve of their own accord. And so it was a fig leaf. The New York Times was saying this was a fig leaf, the Sherman Act. It was the real monopoly was being created by the tariff, the McKinley tariff, but they needed something to cover this up. And so they, so they railed against the evil trusts and, 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 uh, to cover this all up. And so uh, that's why I'm convinced, uh, and why I made this statement earlier, that antitrust uh, from the very beginning was a protectionist racket, and that the textbooks are all basically wrong uh, about this Magna Carta of free enterprise business, and they're wrong because they never looked into it. It's one of these things where they just took the words of somebody in the 1890s and just kept keep repeating this mantra about cartelization. Uh, the most generous thing you can say about the textbook writers is that uh, how this came about was a confusion on what monopoly is. If you look at mono if you can define monopoly as just bigness, you know, big business. Well, yeah, they were becoming very big and successful, like Standard Oil. If you define monopoly in that way, that's why the Austrians define monopoly as you know it has to necessarily be created by government, government intervention, a government franchise, like in the in the so-called public utilities, for example. And another thing I did uh, on, in this era is to research what the economics profession was saying. And there weren't that many professional economists back then. So it was possible to survey uh, just what almost every professional economist who had a, earned a living as an economist said, said about this at the time. This You couldn't do that now. It would be a you know, gigantic survey. It would be very costly. But... Um, uh, fortunately, I ran, this was a miracle that I found this in the library, but I found a doctoral dissertation that was written in 1964 that did exactly this. It, it did a survey of the economist opinions of the Sherman Act in 1890. And, uh, and, and I, in fact, I even found this on microfilm. I didn't even find it in the stacks in the library. And that's why, so it, and I've always been a, a, a library worm and a sort of a, like a prospector, like a gold miner. I've always kind of, kind of enjoyed uh, digging around libraries and finding stuff like this because sometimes it pays off and it, it's it's hard work, which is why most economists don't do it. They tend to be uh, very lazy, and uh, and they get lazier as the years go on with their tenure and all that. But but it's kind of fun uh, to me to do this sort of research, sort of investigative economics, and and this was a real gold mine because I it saved me a lot of time. It, this guy's name was Sanford Gordon, and uh, and he did a, this survey. And I'll just read you his conclusion, because I, I've ended up publishing an article in a journal called Economic Inquiry on this uh, a couple years after I did this. Where, but Gordon says, uh, a big majority of the economists at the time conceded that the combination movement was to be expected, that high fixed costs made large-scale enterprises economical, that competition under these new circumstances frequently resulted in cutthroat competition, that agreements among producers was a natural consequence, and the stability of prices usually brought more benefit than harm to society. They seemed to reject the idea that competition was declining or showed no fear of decline, which they didn't. Uh, uh, I did my own research on this a little later and uh, found that uh, the, almost exclusively the economists at Wharton, Chicago, Yale, uh, who were studying this at the time, uh, were not afraid that there was anything um, anti-consumer going on here. So uh, it's a myth that the economics profession provided guidance to the politicians uh, to deal with this form of so-called market failure, any, uh, antitrust. That never happened. Uh, the, the economist rationale for antitrust came along several decades later, and the late George Stigler uh, from the University of Chicago uh, wrote an article about this, about why economists came to embrace antitrust regulation. And the main reason he gave is that they realized, I could paraphrase Stigler, they realized that they could make considerably more than the minimum wage as antitrust consultants. That's the reason Stickler gave for, 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 for this. And so they became, uh, this is not so bad after all. Uh, and, but, uh, but this article that I wrote, co-authored with Jack High in um, Economic Inquiry, way back in 1988, 
Uh, we surveyed all these economists who were against antitrust, and the argument we made is that the reason they were against it is not because they were paid whores, like uh, Stickler said, uh, although many of them were and are, uh, that's undeniable, uh, was that uh, their, their theory of competition changed. The theory of competition changed. At the time the Sherman Act was passed, all these economists, uh, like John Bates Clark, uh, George Gunton, Simon Patton, the, one of the founders of the Wharton School, David Wells, these are all uh, Richard T. Ely, when they thought of competition, they thought of competition just like the Austrian economists did and do. Competition was a dynamic, rivalrous process of entrepreneurship that involved price cutting, product differentiation, innovation, advertising. These are all elements of competition. Competition is an ongoing process, and these mergers that were occurring were just a, a part of that ongoing process of a competitive market, and they saw the proof. They saw the lower prices and lower costs. And they looked at this at the time and said, well, this is a good thing. This is, this is just how we think competition ought to operate. And so they were dead set against it. We found one uh, a prominent economist who was against antitrust laws, even Richard T. Ely, who was a self-described socialist and the co-founder of the American Economic Association, uh, uh, was against the antitrust laws. He thought they were, they were a bad idea. They were thwart competition. And... Uh, and uh, I, in fact, I have a statement by Ely here he, uh, to show what a socialist he was. He said this, this is the founding statement of the American Economic Association when it was founded. And, and, and people wonder why Mises called, uh, uh, called the AEA a bunch of socialists. And he, he would never join. Have anything to do with it? Here's the founding statement. We hold that the doctrine of laissez-faire is unsafe in politics and unsound in morals. That's part of it. And so... That's how the AEA was founded. And so, and so when, when Mises never joined, people say, well, he was, he's a crank and an, an eccentric and an outsider. What is he talking about? Well, that's what he's talking about. Why would he want to be a part of that? Uh, and so the, the economics profession was against it, but that's the reason we give. And so you see that the theory of competition changed. Uh, any of you who have ever taken a course in microeconomics were taught the newer theory that came around in the 1920s and 30s called perfect competition. And it had these assumptions about what defines a competitive market. And the key assumption is many firms. Many firms. Many firms is good, fewer firms is bad. Uh, that was new. That, was, that, was, that wasn't a part of Adam Smith's definition of competition or anybody, really, up until the 1920s and 30s. And so uh, uh, if you define competition as requiring many firms and, and you see mergers occurring, even if the mergers are resulting in lower prices, a lot of people started to say, well, this is monopoly. Even though the effect was lower prices and better products, more products, uh, you know, greater volume, and so forth, didn't matter. That definition changed the opinion of, of economists. And, uh, and so Jack High and I argue that that's, that's a more likely reason than uh, just the fact that uh, antitrust consultants are paid whores, although we don't deny that that's a... A, a, a truth out there, okay, and so and so that that's my uh, story about the origins of antitrust, and um, uh, another thing that I, that I knew about when I was doing all this work uh, some years ago was that uh, there were state antitrust laws before the federal antitrust law, and so if you want to understand the real origins of this whole area of regulation, uh, they come at the state level. And, uh, and my research uh, is that uh, basically the same thing was going on, that prices were falling. And so uh, businesses and farmers and, uh, who could not match the lower prices complained to their legislatures that we've got to do something about this. And one of the most blatant examples, uh, I'll just give you one quick example of what was going on here, was there were, all of a sudden there was talk of this beef trust, the beef trust, it was a menace to society, okay, beef trust. And what was, how was this beef trust menacing? Well, there was all this talk about the big four, the big four uh, Armour, Swift, and, and a couple of other companies, or the big four beef companies, beef packing companies. Well, now that the railroad industry was pretty well developed by the 1880s, uh, Chicago became the center of the beef packing industry. And so uh, there, were, there were 
chopping up the cattle. And when they originally invented refrigeration, what it was was open train cars in the wintertime. But it still, it enabled them to ship dressed beef, you know, you know, ready to go to the supermarket, for hundreds and hundreds of miles all over the country. And then, of course, you know, they figured out other ways of keeping the beef from spoiling, and then refrigeration came along and, uh, later. But, but in the meantime, all of a sudden, you had uh, little towns and cities all over America, especially the Midwest and uh, you know, as far east as Pittsburgh and places like that, where you had sort of mom and pop meat monopolies. The local butcher shop was charging you know, a certain price for beef. And all of a sudden, here comes mass production, mass production with economies of scale, lower cost of production, enabling the big four to underprice everybody. All of a sudden, these train cars show up with beef that's half the price of what the local mom and pop butcher monopolies are selling, selling meat for. And they did not like that. And you know, they all banded together with their trade associations and went to the state legislatures and said, we've got to do something about this beef trust. They're, they're, they're cutting prices. And, uh, and so in another article that I, that I authored with, co-authored with uh, uh, Don Boudreau, uh, uh, that was in the Review of Austrian Economics some years ago, uh, we found basically the same thing was going on with beef and, and other farm goods in Missouri, especially in your, in your state of Missouri. There was, there was a Senator Vest from Missouri who, who took the lead here and, and had a commission, the Vest Commission, to investigate lower beef prices. What's causing it and what can be done about it? And so they had this big commission, and they, here's what they concluded. The principal cause of the depression, he said the depression, in the prices paid to the cattle raiser and of the remarkable fact that the cost of beef has not fallen in proportion comes from the artificial and abnormal centralization of markets and the absolute control by a few operators thereby made possible. He's talking about the big four. So he admitted that all of this, this abominable centralization of manufacturing, uh, if you will, or the beef dressing industry caused a depression in prices, lower prices. And so the commission recommended federal legislation to put an end to this. And that, that was an impetus to the Sherman Act eventually at the federal level. They used the, uh, the so-called research for this to, uh, to uh, help support the Sherman Act. And so uh, no matter where you look, what was going on was this was an anti-price cutting law, uh, state level, federal level, and on and on. And the same thing, the same type of thing continued to happen with antitrust regulation to this very day. Uh, I'll give you uh, just a few examples of, uh, of this, of what we'd ha we've had to live with for a what, 116 years now or something like that? Uh, uh, beginning in 1969, the federal government spent 13 years prosecuting IBM for being a monopoly. In the meantime, uh, IBM had, was eclipsed by companies like Microsoft and quite a few others, and the judge in the case died. And so the government in 1982 just said, oh, the hell with it, and they gave up with it because if they appointed a new judge, he would, to be credible, he would have to go through 13 years of, of all this litigation and hearings and everything to be up to snuff, and, and, uh, and that would take years uh, for, for a new judge to be credible, and, and, and all that went on, so they, they all the hell with it, and they just dropped it. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, they, they seriously crippled IBM because it was very costly and very time-consuming. It's an unmeasurable amount of man hours that had to be put toward complying with all the requests Friends of mine who have worked at the Federal Trade Commission, for example, uh, told me uh, Bill Shugart is one of them who teaches at Ole Miss. He, he worked at the FTC for a while. He said on a typical merger case, you know, not the big IBM case or the big Microsoft case, but a typical merger case, some bank, you know, a couple of big, bigger banks are going to merge. Uh, the, the FTC will put in all, so many requests for information and paperwork that uh, he said for several days, the biggest U-Haul trucks you can rent will back up to the back door of the uh, Federal Trade Commission building on Constitution Avenue and unload box after box after box of paperwork from, uh, from the company's files somewhere. And, and that's, it has to be very time consuming to do that. And, uh, and of course, a lot of this ends up in the hands of the competition, uh, paperwork, is all proprietary information. So that can be pretty damaging. In 1962, the government forced the Schwinn Bicycle Company to divorce itself from its network of dealers 
Uh, it said it was, uh, it was, it was giving Schwinn uh, an unfair advantage being a manufacturer of bikes if it also had its own dealerships. Okay, uh, Schwinn went bankrupt uh, after that. Um, they, made, they made a recovery, but they went bankrupt. Uh, during the 1950s, RCA was prohibited from charging royalties to American licensees, okay, which was supposedly a monopolistic practice. So RCA uh, licensed its products to uh, Japanese companies, and that helped the Japanese microelectronics industry take over the market, uh, so to speak. Uh, Pan Am Airlines, and most of you probably never heard of Pan American World Airways, but uh, they, they only flew international routes, and this is in the 1960s. And they decided that since air travel was becoming more popular, there were a lot of people, say they flew from uh, New York City to London, uh, well, there are a lot of people in Ohio who would want to go to London, you know, a European vacation, and they had a hard time getting from uh, Ohio to New York City, so they wanted to fly from, you know, let's have feeder routes, let's, let's have some flights from Columbus to New York, New York to London. Uh, since they had a big share of the market, the government said, no, you can't do that. We won't allow you to have feeder routes to bring customers to your international flights. Uh, they went bankrupt because they couldn't do that because their competition could. Their competition did do that, but the, since they had a big market share, they weren't allowed. Uh, General Motors was never prosecuted under the antitrust laws, but if, uh, if you read a history of, there are several histories of General Motors and, and, and you know, scholars, management scholars have been studying them for decades and decades. But um, from 1937 until 1956, it was company policy to never let its market share go above 45% for any reason for fear of an antitrust lawsuit. And so they instructed all their managers, don't make the cars too good and don't price them too low or else we'll get too, too big a market share and uh, we'll be prosecuted and, and we'll have to go through you know, maybe 10 years of litigation and who wants to do that. And so I just wanted to give you a few examples of, since some of you, I assume, haven't really studied this or don't know much about antitrust, it's sort of a, uh, you know, not the top topic on your mind, but this is uh, what I was uh, referring to when I said 116 years of misguided, uh, misguided regulation. I don't think it's ever been misguided. I think it's, it always has a purpose there, and it's usually, uh, usually uh, uh, with one company sues another, uh, in fact, about 90% of all antitrust lawsuits are private. They don't involve go the uh, government agencies. They involve the government courts, but it's one company using the antitrust laws to sue another company. Now think about that for a minute. If one company is acting like a monopoly in your industry and raising prices, is that good or bad for you? What's that? It's, it's good no matter how you look at it. If, if your competitor is raising his prices, that means you can raise your price too, or if you don't raise your price, you'll gain market share. They let, you know, you'll, have, you'll be more competitive. So either way, you're gonna like this. So why on earth would you sue if they really are acting monopolistically? You would only sue if they're cutting their price by saying they're gaining market share and I suspect monopoly. So when you, with all these private lawsuits, uh, they're typically over a, uh, against a, uh, a company that is being too good at competing. They're either introducing new products that are catching on, uh, they're dropping their prices, or they're doing both of that sort of thing. It just doesn't make sense that you would sue a company for acting like a monopolist in your industry, because it would benefit. The higher price could create an umbrella effect for every firm in the industry. Everybody can make more money if, if, if the leading company, the biggest company is doing that. And so typically, uh, an antitrust lawsuit will be by definition anti-competitive. And I competitive, and I'll conclude that you know the best book to read on this is Dominic Armentano's Antitrust and Monopoly. It's probably for sale outside the door over there, if, if it's not sold out. It's it's a little dated. It, it ended I think uh, in 1982, something like that was when it was actually first published. But it's a good history book. It's a good on the, the history of. Uh, it covers 55 of the uh, most uh, famous federal antitrust cases in American history during that period, 1890 to 1982, basically 90 years. And, so, and, and there's a lot of good theory, and it was, a spy, and it was the whole book was inspired by uh, Murray Rothbard's suggestions and Austrian economic analysis, too. 
And, uh, but here's what Armitano says about it. Uh, I'll read you his, one of his conclusions. It says, antitrust policy in America is a misleading myth that has served to draw public attention away from the actual process of monopolization that has been occurring throughout the economy. The general public has been deluded into believing that monopoly is a free market problem and that the government, through antitrust enforcement, is on the side of the angels. The facts are exactly the opposite. Antitrust served as a convenient cover for an insidious process of monopolization in the marketplace. And so uh, I like that quote because it confirms my interpretation of the, whole, the origins of antitrust. And, and if he agrees with me, he must be a very smart guy, uh, in, in my opinion. But um, uh, one final quote is one of my favorites. Maybe you've heard this before. This is from a famous uh, central planner and says, who said, uh, the world of antitrust is reminiscent of Alice's Wonderland. Everything seemingly is, yet apparently isn't, simultaneously. It is a world in which competition is lauded as the basic axiom and guiding principle, yet too much competition is condemned as cutthroat. It is a world in which actions designed to limit competition are branded as criminal when taken by businessmen, yet praised as enlightened when initiated by government. It is a world in which the law is so vague that businessmen have no way of knowing whether specific actions will be declared illegal until they hear the judge's verdict after the fact. Anybody want to guess who the central planner was that said that? Greenspan? Yeah, that was Alan Greenspan. The graduate students know it. There. <laughs> there. That was Alan Greenspan in 1962 in a book uh, edited by Ayn Rand called uh, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. That's, this was back long before he became a central planner. This was when he was still a, uh, a pretty good guy. He also had another essay in that same book uh, in defense of the gold standard. And, uh, and uh, Congressman Ron Paul, uh, when Greenspan was still the uh, head central planner at the Fed, uh, uh, would have to go in front of the House Banking Committee, where Ron is on the uh, is on the committee, and Ron would badger him every you know at every meeting, and they would ignore Ron, of course, but they would <laughs> badger him anyway. And, and Ron told the story in a speech he gave here that uh, he brought a copy of this essay, Greenspan's essay on the gold standard. <laughs> Uh, to him and asked him, do you still believe everything in this essay? And he says, Greenspan said, uh, yes, I do, every word of it. And then he got Greenspan to autograph it. He got autographed his, 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 his essay. But, uh, but, uh, but he, was, he was very good on antitrust. What's that? He asked if you want to put a disclaimer on it when he signed it. Oh, yeah, yeah, no disclaimer. He has, a, he has an unabridged uh, signature on that. On that. But uh, so that's, uh, that's all I'm going to say for now about antitrust, and we have time for questions or comments of any kind uh, about sources or anything like that. Uh, Dr. Woods has uh, an example of predatory, the failure of predatory pricing in his book, uh, The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, where he talks about this, uh, this American entrepreneur who put out a, a product in the United States at, let's say, $5, and he wanted to put that product into the German market, uh, but the German market uh, had also another company. Um, he wanted to put it out $5 over there, too. But they were selling it at ten dollars. So the German company said, um, "If you don't get out of Germany, um, we're going to sell uh, the same oil or the same product in your company in your country at a lower price." So they went ahead and did that. Um, but the American entrepreneur bought up all the products uh, that they were selling in America mm. and sold it at a higher at the higher mm. you know price in, uh, oh, yeah. in Germany. Mm. Got the cartel out of business. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember reading that in that yeah. book too. Yeah. Yeah, so it doesn't work. Predatory pricing doesn't uh, doesn't work. Uh, uh, what the whole, the, well, the whole theory is um, has a lot of holes in it, uh, just logically too. And it, um, the, in fact, there was uh, one one article. There was a, a publication called the Antitrust Bulletin. That if if you work in this area, this, this you might be familiar with the Antitrust Bulletin. And there was one article in it that I uh, cited in some of my work that claimed that the authors said. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna look at um, all the antitrust cases that have ever been filed uh, by the federal government for predatory pricing, and we're gonna take a close look and decide uh, was there really predatory pricing, and they look at hundreds and hundreds of cases and they they said well there are seven of them that uh, could conceivably be construed over the past 70 years as predatory pricing, as, as monopoly power gained by predatory pricing, but then if you keep reading they said. Uh, that you know, but in no case um, uh, was there fewer than a dozen competitors, 
in these industries. So, so they never they never were able to do what predatory pricing says and create a monopoly, which is a single seller. Um, all they did was cut their prices and drive the higher price enough pr higher price competitors out of the market so that there were only a dozen left instead of maybe 20 five, as, as five years earlier. So there's never really been any evidence at all of any kind of anybody gaining a, a monopoly power of any kind by, by this method. But like Armentano said, it's all diversion. Um, economists have spent entire careers sitting at their desks uh, uh, inventing tall tales about uh, conspiracies called oligopolies uh, and uh, price leadership models and, uh, and so forth. And there are hundreds of models of oligopoly and they're all theoretical conspiracies. And so you have these economists uh, spending their entire careers writing theoretical models, not, not based on reality, but theoretical models like this. When they send their kids to the monopoly government schools, the monopoly trash collector run by the city government picks up their trash. Uh, the, you know, the, uh, you know, you just pick any agency of government. Is they're all a monopoly. They, they watch cable TV at night from the monopoly franchise company given a monopoly by the by the government, and and, and they and they pretty much uh, apart from some of the Chicago schoolers and the Austrians, the the economics profession ignored that for generations. They're they're surrounded. The, by monopoly power, the farm lobby that creates a farm cartel through the Department of Agriculture, they, they ignore that, and they focus on their theoretical models of oligopoly, and so they've demonized the market by creating a, uh, a, a faux market, you know, it's a, a fake market, you know, it's a theoretical market, while largely ignoring the real market. Uh, and that's, that's what has always appealed to me, been appealing to me uh, by uh, the Austrian school uh, that, um, like Joe Salerno said earlier, von Mises and others always, uh, they were good theorists, but they always focused on real world markets and events and, and, and wrote about them. I mean, you can't really understand the real world events without some theoretical guide. You have to understand economic theory, and uh, especially Austrian economics, I think is the best theory, but, uh, but, the, but you have to look out the window once in a while. It's, but, so the, all these theories, uh, there, there are hundreds of them, and if you take microeconomics, you'll be taught a lot of them. But uh, the thing about these oligopoly theories, as long as there's the ability for entry to occur, they all break down. They all ultimately have to assume no entry because if entry can occur, you don't have any more oligopoly power, monopoly power. And in today's world, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's almost universally the case, even with government regulation. You know, uh, satellites have broken up the cable monopoly you know, to a large degree. You can use satellites. Uh, you don't have to buy cable TV anymore. Um, and then and computers and the internet. Pretty soon, you're going to be able to combine television and in, in your in your PC pretty cheaply and easily. Uh, other questions, uh, comments? Everybody's always worn out by the end of the day here. You, you people are weak. <laughs> what are you drinking too much at night or something? Yeah. yeah, you're all younger than me, with the exception of maybe one or two people. I don't know, uh, uh, but uh, and, you, and you're all worn out by the end of the day. There's a, a robust young man in the back. I was going to ask, uh, sometimes when you have a merger, the cost of the integration, like the merger of Viola itself, yeah. and uh, increase the cost of the company a fair amount, is it possible to essentially change the data around somewhere that there would be higher costs for associated clients? Well, yeah, all, well all, mergers, all mergers don't cause lower costs. I don't think no, <laughs> no one has ever uh, uh, claimed that. Although, uh, what I would claim, though, is that uh, no one can know that until the merger happens. And so, uh, what, what a lot of economists do who are opposed to mergers, like uh, the, inter the more interventionist-minded economists, they fall into what uh, Friedrich Hayek called the pretense of knowledge. They, they claim to know in advance, uh, before the merger happens and before the market reveals to us what the costs are going to be that uh, uh, we shouldn't allow this merger to happen because it's going to raise costs or it's going to do something bad to consumers. There's no way of knowing that. The only way to know is to let the market work and reveal to us what happens. That, that's how we find out what the most efficient structure of industry is. And, uh, for example, there's a big study done by the guy I mentioned, Scherer, Friedrich Scherer, and a guy named David Ravenscraft. They wrote this into a book, and they studied... I forget the number, it was over 500 mergers over about a 30, 35 year period. And they found that over half of them 
half of these companies uh, within 10 years spun off the company that, that they had previously acquired so that the merger didn't work out, like you're suggesting the cost went up. And so on that basis, they conclude we need more government regulation of mergers. But uh, the assumption there is that government bureaucrats, aided by economists like Scherer and Ravenscraft, have a crystal ball and can look at these mergers and say, nah, they're not, that one's not going to work out. We'll allow this one. We won't allow There's no way of doing it. It's all pretentious. You know, they, they, it's, uh, it's hubris. They, they, they have no way of knowing that. And um, the way I would look at it, which I think is the way um, most Austrian economists would look at this, is that these, these mergers that d fail to reduce costs do have some value in that they tell us what doesn't work. And that it's the only way to know what doesn't work. And so uh, if they don't work, they won't be imitated. The mergers that do work, those will be imitated and it will be repeated. And so the whole industry will become more efficient by uh, merging in that way. For example, uh, a company that has a lot of production engineering expertise merging with another company that has little engineering expertise but is great on marketing. So they'll have a, some sort of a, a, a synergy there, you know, good marketing and good engineering. Uh, that, that might work, but other types of mergers may, maybe not, uh, won't work. But uh, so mergers, you know, the, the whole mergers are a process. They're part of the competitive market, and the market reveals information to us. And that's one important kind of information is what the most efficient structure of industry is. So, uh, in fact, Hayek's Nobel Prize uh, speech when he accepted the award, the award was called The Pretense of Knowledge. It was all about this. And it was published in the American Economic Review in, when was it? Uh, probably around 1976 in the May issue, I think. And so and the, the theme is that this is all pretentious, that some central planner could know in advance what's going to happen. too much prestige, yeah? Yeah, that's true. You know, the, the Nobel Prize in Economics is funded by the Swedish Central Bank. It's not funded by Alfred Nobel's uh, uh, money. That was the science, you know, but uh, the Swedish Central Bank started the uh, Nobel Prize in Economics, so it's a, it's a prize given out by central bankers. <laughs> and so that's probably another reason why Hayek, uh, he took the money, though. Uh, he took the money. He didn't turn down the money. Uh, yeah, his co-winner was the 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 Kami Pinko Gunnar Gunnar Myrdal, the Swedish communist, and uh, so the Nobel Committee at that time was that 1975, 1974. I mean, you lose track of time anymore, but uh, uh, they couldn't stomach giving it just to Hayek. They had to give it to uh, to a communist also, and uh, uh, which is the uh, well, they started with a Kami, Paul Samuelson, right? That's he was the first. Uh, no, he wasn't. He wasn't a Kami. He just he just. Uh, he just uh, idolized the Soviet economy a lot, as these guys were telling me. Uh, one of their professors at GMU, uh, for those of you who don't know about Paul Samuelson's textbooks, uh, for decades he had a, a graph in it. Maybe I can uh, imitate the graph. Comparing, uh, it looks something like this. Here's a U.S. economic growth. And here's a USSR. <laughs> and then this year would be, say, 2000. Then in the 1990 issue, issue of the book, it erase that and say, well, 2020. <laughs> and then, and then the, you know, the you know, later edition, well, it's not looking, it's not working out that way. And 2050. And, and so for, beginning with the 1948 version, he had a graph kind of like this. Uh, just taking as truth uh, statistics published by Stalin on economic growth in Russia, the Soviet Union, and uh, claiming that oh, they're, uh, they're growing so fast that, uh, you know, at a certain date they're going to be bigger than us. You know? And uh, I, don't, I don't know when the last one was. Was it 1988? You guys remember that around there? 88 or 89? So, so, somewhere around there. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, so any, any other questions, uh, comments? Mm -hmm. All worn out, worn ragged. Okay, well, uh, I don't want to keep you here against your will then. We'll, we'll call it a day.